when we're talking about conceptualizing and thinking about decision making in organizations, in other words, how decisions are made in businesses, we're going to be drawing a lot from a lot of what we've already covered. So when we think about how we communicate, how we make um, uh, look at organizations, all of those are going to be kind of feeding into this topic. So relatively speaking, just make sure that you do read through the chapter. Um, I'm going to only hit some highlights and I'm mainly going to dive into specifically one particular model that is often used in organizations to kind of, again, help us walk, walk through a more objective process. And when I say objective process, the goal here is better decision making. So a lot of times we'll talk about the concepts of objective or subjective. Objective is generally meaning a process or a decision making system or even data or knowledge that would not be disputed by multiple people. So, for instance, a lot of our mechanical measurements would be considered objective. The goal of a lot of psychological testing is to become objective. In other words, if someone takes the test multiple times, they get very similar, if not the same responses. Subjective still covers a lot of decision making. There are some times when there's no way to get enough data that two or three or four different people looking at the same information would make the exact same decision. That means the decision is made subjectively. In other words, it's still drawing on evidence and data and basis and previous experience, but people may not agree. And a lot of decisions are subjective. A lot of decisions are personal. So we're not trying to remove the subjectivity from decision making, but we are trying to come up with a system that reduces the subjectivity. Ideally, good decisions should be agreed on by anyone from any background. That would be an objective decision. Now, obviously, a lot of major things that are happening within our culture are subjective, and we see that in the fact that people actually disagree. It's why we have different companies providing different solutions. It's why we have different political parties arguing about what is the right way. It's why we have different social movements. A lot of times, if you're in one of those social movements, you may believe that your thoughts and your decisions are objective. But that's one of the other things that within an organization and a business, if the goal is to be successful, to expand, and to be profitable, we want to put that subjectivity to the test. We don't want to fall prey to just assuming that our subjective decisions are objective unless we've actually gone through a process to make sure they're objective. So decision making is the process of making choices for many several alternatives. In other words, there's a decision to be made. And what we want to be thinking about is how do we have a more analytical or objective model of decision making in that process? So we're going to go over an eight step approach to organizational decision making that focuses on both the formulation of the problem, the identification of the solutions, and then the implementation of those solutions. So when we talk about formulation, this is the process of understanding a problem and making a decision about it. And that's one of the areas that we often fall prey to in any kind of decision making. We tend to assume that we know the problem. Um, we have a set answer. You have a problem with getting to work on time and you don't have, and your car's broken. The solution is automatically get a new car. And that might be the correct solution, but the formulation process is more systematic. What are the alternatives? What does it look like if you walk to work and what's the cost, what's the benefits and what's the problems? What about if you use public transportation? What if you use a non-motorized form? What does that look like? What kind of weather systems are you expecting? So for example, if you were in a very low rain, relatively temperate environment, a bike might be a lot better option than if you were in a much more less pleasant environment where a car might make more sense. Also, what's the availability of public transportation? So this is just one example, but that's what we're talking about formulation. It's about really understanding the problem and the possible alternatives before we just go with the standard answer. Once we have a objective list of potentials and the uh, possible answers to this problem, we also want to evaluate them on kind of a cost versus benefit ratio. And then once we've decided on what makes the most sense, we need to implement the process of carrying out that decision. So as I said, this is an eight step process and we're gonna go over this model in multiple ways. The first one is just to walk through the model. So the first is to identify the problem. So for example, there's insufficient funds to meet payroll obligations. So that's our problem. We wanna make sure we can define it. We wanna make sure that we can state what the problem is. 
And that might require a little bit of time and research as well. Once we have that problem, we want to define the objective. So what is a successful solution to this problem? In this case, increase cash flow. But that is different options. So there might be other objectives, such as reduce the payroll obligations. But in this case, we've defined the objective. There's insufficient funds, and we need to increase the cash flow. We then need to make a pre-decision, deciding to solve this problem alone. So who needs to be involved in the problem solving? Who needs to make this decision? What information is needed? We then need to generate alternatives. So how can we actually achieve this objective? So what are all of the possible answers? Raising prices, layoff workers, liquidate equipment, what are our options? Then once we have that option list, we need to evaluate those alternatives. So higher prices may lower sales, which means again, an unintended consequence, we may raise our prices and find that our sales reduce equally to where we are still have the same amount of cash flow. Um, laying off workers may slow production. So yes, we can save some cash flow by removing a few of the workers that we're paying, but if that also then reduces the amount of products equally, that might not be a good solution either. So we need to think about the pros and cons of each. Once we have this information, so notice steps one through five, a decision hasn't still been made. It's a systematic process of identifying the problem, what's the objective of how are we solving the problem, deciding who is needed to be involved in the problem solving, what information is needed, generating the alternatives, what are the various things that we could do, and then evaluating them. Finally, we get to six, make a choice, decide to raise prices slightly and sell excess inventory. We then implement the choice. We raise the prices slightly, we sell off the ex ex excess inventory. So we do what's necessary to actually enact this choice. And then finally, we follow up. Do I now have sufficient funds? In other words, did I actually attain the objective? If not, we may need to come back to the problem. Is the same problem still there or is it potentially a problem we didn't meet? Notice that this is defined as a cycle. So one through eight often leads to one starting back up again. But if we truly are wanting to make objective decisions, this is a good model to use because it's based on the idea of getting around some of our natural tendencies as people, as humans, to make mistakes in our thinking. So it is an analytical model. It's a model that helps us try to be more objective. And notice that we have three major phases in this model, in the eight steps. There's decision formulation. So we identify the problem, we identify, define the objectives, and we make the pre-decisions who is needed to be involved. We then consider the decision itself. We generate the alternatives, we evaluate the alternative solutions, so basically creating a pros and cons list. And then finally, we make the choice. And finally, once the choice is made, we implement the decision, and then we follow up. Is it working? So. Within that, we also need to think about individual decision styles. So decision styles are different between people with respect to their orientation towards decisions. And decision style model is another way to conceptualize who decision makers are as just a personality trait based on solely their style of decision making. So it conceptualizes according to which people use one of the four predominant decision styles, directive, analytical, conceptual, and behavioral. And it should be noted there's a lot of individual differences that go into this, but this is kind of the end result. If I want to know how someone is likely to act in a decision-making capacity, this is a good model to use. However, I probably also might want to determine is someone in one of these categories. If the goal is classification into categories, I'm probably going to look at things like risk aversion versus risk acceptance. I'm probably going to look at positive and negative affectivity. So there's a lot of predeterminants that determine what is your leadership style or your decision-making style. But if we're really looking at what kind of decision-making styles are, this is a pretty good model, and we're going to go into these four parts of it in the next slide. So the decision model basically suggests that there is directive style, prefers simple, clear solutions, makes decisions rapidly, does not consider many alternatives, and relies on existing rules. There's analytical, prefers complex problems, carefully analyzes the alternative, enjoys solving problems, willing to use innovative methods. There's conceptual, more socially oriented, humanistic and artistic approaches, solve problems creatively, enjoying the new ideas. And then there's behavioral, concerns for their own or concerns for their organization, interest in helping others, open to suggestions, relying on meetings. All four of these styles will fit certain situations. If a lot of quick decisions are needing to be made and they're fairly unambiguous, unambiguous situations, you probably want someone with a directive style. 
If you're needing to go through all of those eight steps systematically, you probably want someone that has an analytical style. If the problem is mainly a social problem, so interactions, teams, et cetera, within a workplace, less than a structural problem, a conceptual decision maker may be more important. And finally, if it really is kind of a long-term goal, changing culture, for instance, involving making sure that everyone buys into the decisions being made, then a behavioral style is probably more appropriate. In all cases, when we're talking about applying psychological knowledge and human behavior to organizations, we're almost always talking about some form of it depends kind of model. And by it depends, I mean that we want to match, we basically want to match the person with the environment or fit of the role. So depending on the kind of problems that we're having, depending on the kinds of decisions that are needing to be made, different types of decision makers are gonna be more or less successful. We also need to be aware that we may use a lot of heuristics when we make decisions. Simple decision rules used to make quick decisions on complex problems. And these are a couple things, again, that we want to at least be aware of and to look out for when we're making decisions. The availability heuristic, the tendency for people to judge their ju base their judgments on information that is readily available to them, although it may be potentially inaccurate, thereby adversely affecting decision quality. The availability uh, heuristic basically means that we have a tendency to over attend to more unique situations and that therefore becomes very easy to call up. It's very easy to think about the last news story of an airplane crash or the last news story about a mass shooting event. However, both of those are incredibly rare and a very small part of the overall statistics. For example, if we're looking at transportation death, there's far more deaths proportionally and just by pure numbers when we look at automobiles compared to airplanes. You've probably heard that airplanes are far more safer statistically than driving in a car, and this is well supported. However, we rarely think about car crashes when we get in a car. I will honestly admit I have never gotten onto a plane where somewhere in my brain hasn't been the thought, what happens if there's an accident? So that's an example of the availability heuristic. The representation, representativeness heuristic is a tendency to perceive others in stereotypical ways if they appear to be typically representing other categories to which they belong. This doesn't just mean people. This also may be problems. So if a problem looks stereotypical, if a problem looks very simple, we have a tendency to not try to go any deeper. We pretty much are, have a tendency to go, oh, this is a common problem. We've encountered it before. This solution has always worked. Let's apply this solution. So both of these are examples of how, even through an objective process, we may need to purposely and systematically gather actual data and base rates to make our decisions on. And we need to be I'm sure we're not falling prey to doing the same thing the same way every time simply because a problem seems stereotypical. We also need to watch out for escalation of commitment and there's a lot of research on this. It's continuing a course of action even though it shows signs of failures, business decisions, military decisions, and the eight step problem process that we just went through, that evaluation at the end, that step eight, is it working? The danger there is a lot of times, if the answer is it isn't working, there is a tendency, we've already put in steps one through seven, we've already gone through this process. So if step eight says it isn't working, there's a strong tendency for people to go, well, let's just keep trying. Let's put more time, more effort, more resources into the same solution. And that may be what's required, but we wanna make sure that we are not falling into the trap of escalating commitment. We have a tendency to like decisions that we've already made. We tend to notice things that we've already made. If you've ever bought a new car and suddenly noticed how many people drive that car, that's an example of an escalation of commitment and the availability heuristic. We never attended to the car before because we didn't have one. Now that we have one, we suddenly start noticing them everywhere. I never paid attention to the make and model of trucks until I bought a truck and started to kind of fall into the culture of the particular type of truck that I drove and the people that drive those trucks. I started, people started sharing memes with me about differences in truck ownership. And I started to just attend to what trucks were out there. Those trucks didn't change. Those have always been out there. I'm just now attending to them. So that's that availability heuristic. I'm now attending to that information. Trucks seem to be much more common to me now than they used to simply because I own a truck. However, it's also an, also an escalation of commitment. Now that I have made the decision of what brand of truck that I have, 
it is very likely I'm going to stick with that truck brand, even if it not, isn't necessarily the best truck for me. So it's going to be basically something that I'm escalating or it's a sunk cost, a bias towards consistency, um, a self-justification. All of these result in escalation of commitment. So we like to believe that we are good decision makers. So if we've made a decision, we pretty much start looking for the positives and not the negatives. If I objectively thought about the truck that I own, I probably could come up with some cons. Actually, it runs through tires much quicker than it probably should. That would be a negative that I tend to have to force myself to remember. Because what I do remember is all the pluses of the truck that I bought, which is leading me to buying from that same company again. Also, we have a bias towards consistency over experimentation. If something works, we tend to stick with it over experimenting and trying something else. Now, there is some evidence that this is not a bad idea, and none of these are necessarily cognitive mistakes. A lot of times, consistency is the right answer. What we want to watch out for, though, is when we are favoring consistency and self-justification over even examining other options. The final thought is the sunk cost ratio, and this basically means that once we've started to spend money, we have a tendency to continue to spend money. So if you've bought a car that you aren't very fond of and you have to keep spending money on it, and you keep doing it, if you actually sat down and realized, okay, so it cost me this much to begin with, and now I have put the following amount of money into that, would I have spent that amount of money as a lump sum at the start for this car? A lot of times the answer is going to be no. And I can tell you from personal experience, I've experienced sunk costs before. And sometimes I've managed to break myself out of it. So one example of me recognizing a sunk cost and refusing it was actually I had really good tickets to a Van Halen concert once. The problem was is I had bought them months and months in advance and it ended up I had a business trip right beforehand. So I flew out on a Tuesday. I was at a conference for five days and I flew back on Sunday morning with the Van Halen concert being that same Sunday. When I got home, the last thing I ever wanted to do was go to a concert, even a concert I really cared about. I was exhausted, I was tired, and I thought to myself, how much had I had spent on those tickets? Would I be willing to spend that amount to not go to a concert? And the answer was yes, I didn't go. So there was a seat at that concert where I wasn't at because I recognized the sunk cost. An example of me falling prey to sunk cost is the most recent house purchase I made. I purchased a property and I knew it was going to require some money to be put in. The budget that actually ended up at the end, you know, once we were done with all of the repairs that were needed, and all of them were over budget, all of them took longer than they should have, and all of them ended up being spiraling into higher costs. When I put that together at the end, I would have never spent that money on this property as a lump sum. So that's an example of me actually falling prey to sunk cost. So we want to be aware of this tendency towards an escalation of commitment. We want to think about it when we're at phase eight of our model, and we just want to be aware of it throughout any of our decision making, because these are some of the reasons that we make poor decisions on occasion. So group decision making generally has positive benefits. It's one of the things that we really focus on, on trying to have teams making decisions. It's a pooling of resources. So one of the parts of that eight phase model was gathering information, gathering resources. It's easier to do as a group. It allows the specialization of labor. So you can create a group that has expertise in all of the areas that might affect the decision. Generally also speaking is that if a group of people all come to a consensus, there's usually greater acceptance of the decision when it comes from a group. The potential time, it may take more long, it will, actually not may, it will take longer and more time and, re and require more time from individuals. So an individual making a decision versus seven people making a decision, it is going to take time and we have to be very careful, are we wasting that time? There may be disruptive conflict, though there very is possibility that there isn't consensus that the group itself cannot decide. And we also need to make sure that we're allowing every group member to have an equal voice, that it isn't being led or dominated by group leaders. When we find this intimidation or domination, we often talk about this as groupthink, the tem tendency of members of a highly cohesive group to so strongly confirm to group pressures regarding a certain decision that they fail to think critically, rejecting the potential of correcting, correcting influence of outsiders or even minority members within the group, people of a different opinion. So when we're looking at group decision-making, 
we want to maximize the likelihood of the benefits while minimizing the likelihood of the problems. And we want to watch out to make sure that we're not simply trying to grab that greater acceptance from a group decision by getting rid of all the other positives. In other words, having a group that just agrees with everything. Think again about that eight step model. And you can see that if you have a group that the focus of the group is simply conforming, you're not really gonna have a lot of success of coming up with a better decision making. And we've talked about group think before, but again, it really does apply to decision making, especially in organizations where even if there is one person who's making the final decision, they're often making that decision after talking to larger groups of people and having people present them with information on the problem. So again, just a quick little model of group think is our last slide on decision making organizations. We see it most often in high levels of, or higher levels of group cohesion. So again, the more cohesive the group, the more likely it might fall into groupthink. When there's a pressure to go along with the group, in other words, the goal of the group is no longer coming up with the best answers. The goal is showing cohesion even if it isn't there. Some of the pre or antecedents or the process is a reluctance to question the group's decisions. Some of the symptoms include illusions that decisions are unanimous even when they aren't, and a belief that the group is inherently correct even without going through a process. The def defects obviously is a failure to consider the alternatives, a reluctance to re-examine other options. In other words, people, groups that fall prey to groupthink are also much more likely to have that escalation of commitment, and a biased and incomplete use of information. And the result of all this is poor decision making. So hopefully this helps you get an idea of just a process that we want to use and the questions we want to ask through the decision making process to move us more towards an objective decision and further away from subjective decision making. So as always, if you have any questions, feel free to use the discussion board on Canvas and I'll talk to you next week.